<laughs> Thanks, everyone. Today, I want to tell you a story about where we've been and where we're going with UI and virtual reality and leaping into new realities with Angular. A little bit about me before we get started. Uh, my name's Austin McDaniel. I'm also known as NG Panda. Uh, if you guys do the Twitter thing or GitHub, uh, follow me on there. I talk a lot about JavaScript and the Angular community. I love giving back uh, to the community and doing open source. And if you haven't checked out Angular Air, I'm a panelist on there every week, uh, also known as NG Panda. First, let's reflect on where we've been and how we use uh, and interact with computers. Does anyone remember punch cards? Don't worry, I won't make you raise your hands. <laughs> and then there was keyboards. Mouse came along, and then the iPad and the iPhone revolutionized everything with touch. But as these interfaces evolved, our tools had to too. jQuery helped us tame the DOM, and Angular helped us climb new mountains with all its goodness in two-way binding, form validation, et cetera, et cetera. But things are, get, things are changing again and faster than ever. Virtual reality and augmented reality are dominating the buzz today. And they're changing everything about how we build user experiences and how we interact with them. It's a funny thing, though, if you've ever heard the phrase that nothing is new anymore, it's just rehashes of the old things, this could not be even more true with virtual reality. The fundamentals of virtual reality actually date back to 1838, uh, which is before photography was even invented. It uses a technique called stereoscopy. Stereoscopy is the... Uh, it, is the idea of putting two images right beside each other to the left and to the right of your eye and with just a little bit of overlap. This creates a illusion of a 3D depth and a binocular vision. If you add head tracking, you have virtual reality as we know it today. But everything needs to evolve and our tooling is evolving too. One thing that we're we're using today is called WebVR. And WebVR is actually accomplished through a technique called WebGL, which is relatively new. It was first landed in 1.0 in 2016, but was first introduced in 2014. WebGL is required to create these experiences because it lets us tap our native GPU of the computer and really create rich and immersive environments. There's a few tools out there right now for WebGL that allow us to build these type of immersive environments and even some that support WebVR. The biggest one is called 3JS, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But first, we need to look at the problems that we have when we're trying to develop interfaces today. We have interaction events such as click, keyboard, touch. We have viewport events such as window resize, lifecycle hooks for initialization, rendering, and deconstruction, animations, and data flow. And virtual reality introduces even more problems. We have desktop versus mobile VR, head tracking, gestures, voice recognition for input, shaders. And I think the biggest thing that we need to take away here is virtual reality actually changes the way that we are going to be building our interfaces because we cannot interact with immersive interfaces with a keyboard and mouse. I don't know if you've ever tried, you're just wearing the headset and you're like typing and you miss the keys all the time. We have to really change our thought process of that. And using virtual or using voice recognition and gestures and controllers are ways that we can accomplish this. So this is a lot of code, so don't strain your eyes, but I did want to show this slide just to give you a little context of what we have to do today to build a WebGL scene. So all this code does is set up a basic scene. We're putting together a camera, a scene, a directional light, and adding a couple events. I'm literally not even adding anything to the scene with this. Now, obviously, there's a lot of code here. It's very error prone. It's difficult to follow, easy to make memory leaks. Does that remind you of something? You know, JavaScript like 10 years ago, maybe? <laughs> there is light at the end of the tunnel, though. Um, there's a, some new tools that are out there, one of which being A-Frame. It allows us to create the markup-like uh, component composition that we have in Angular today. If you look at this, 
it kind of looks like Angular code. You might have thought it was at first. Um, it's got all the same characteristics. We define a scene, we've got a light, um, and we create a spear, and we use input bindings, et cetera. Now obviously, now, obviously, this isn't Angular, but what if it could be? Again, it has all those same characteristics that we're using today to build components and widgets and forms. The team at Google is always thinking one step ahead. These guys are geniuses, I tell you. Um, and so they have been thinking about all the different ways that uh, we might want to use Angular to render different scenes today. You know, whether that be on the web, uh, which is the most common one, mobile native, um, using native script, uh, the desktop using Electron or server side with all kinds of different server backends. We can all do that today because of custom renderers. So what custom renderers are is they actually abstracted away the concrete implementation of creating DOM elements, adding styles, adding children to the scene, and they actually made it where you can implement your own. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to use DOM. You can use, you know, classic ASP if you choose. <laughs> Um, and we can, so if we think about that and we look at all the different ways that they're leveraging it today, could we do the same thing to render components like, we, like A-Frame does? So because WebGL is a mix of DOM, Canvas, and um, events that the browser listens to, what we actually want to do to create this type of renderer is we want to override the default DOM renderer. Now, WebGL, uh, the meshes that you create there are not exactly DOM elements. Um, they're you, these special mesh, op mesh objects, and th they don't actually represent anything in the DOM. So if we're actually going to compose these, you know, your classic DOM render is actually going to start rendering those to the, uh, to the view. And we don't want that. If any of us know anything about the browser is it does not like lots of HTML. <laughs> That's why we have virtual scrolling, et cetera. So we're gonna render a lot of unneeded DOM. So what we can do is we can actually override the DOM render and blacklist any WebGL components that we might have. So if you take a look at this, and this is really awesome, we've got the same markup uh, that we had earlier where we define a renderer. We put some, uh, we put some controls on this, screen, we add a scene, we add a camera, we add some lights, and then we define a spear mesh, which is using ng4 there to loop over a collection of balls and using input bindings to actually set positions on those balls. The most clean, elegant component composition code in, what, 10 lines of code there. Under the hood, it's relatively simple. Uh, we just have a spear component. We have a couple inputs for the position. And in the, in an, on a knit, what I do is I create a spear geometry. I create a mesh object. And then I say, OK, let's use the positions of the inputs to bind that to the thing. So I'm creating a one-to-one -one mapping here with the actual WebGL object and my Angular component. Now that we've done that, we've just rendered something to the DOM that doesn't really represent anything in the DOM and it's not actually in the scene yet. So what we need to do is in our scene component, what we can do is we can actually use our content child decorator to read out all the spear components that are in, in our scene and then iterate over those on, in the after content init function and add those to our scene. And now we have a fully rendered scene with a bunch of spears. <laughs> We've actually done the hard part now. Uh, actually adding web VR and making web VR is pretty simple now. Um, remember I said it's just two images put, to, put beside each other. And what we can do is we can copy our, our DOM structure, our components, and just lay them out right beside each other. Um, but fortunately, there's a lot of tools out there that help us do that. 3JS has a built-in uh, VR effect that will just add a filter to our canvas and duplicate the, uh, the camera. Because WebVR is pretty new, it is going to require some polyfills. Um, 
The polyfills are gonna add the ability to normalize the browser APIs, add the events for like positioning, orientation, poses, uh, uh, add the ability to do uh, chromeless views and do head tracking. And now that we're in VR, we can get rid of the mouse and keyboard controls and now just use head tracking for our navigation. So let's check out a demo. What does this actually look like? So I'm gonna fire up Switch over here. So I've got a relatively simple demo here that looks really cool in virtual reality. That's the bad thing about virtual reality. It's like very hard to demo because it doesn't look cool on a screen. But we have about 50 spears here and we're bouncing them up and down. And you can see, you, I'm using all the same um, controls that I did earlier to bind these together. And down here, we've got a control called uh, a VR toggle button. Because we're actually, I can't actually demo, uh, pass you guys out cardboards, I asked Frosty about this. He said there was no budget for <laughs> passing out Google Pixels and Daydreams. So um, I, installed a uh, WebVR uh, Chrome extension that'll allow me to emulate my browser to emulate this. So now that I've got this enabled, I can actually open this up. And now you'll see I have two cameras, if you can kind of see it here, um, with the balls bouncing. So it's the same uh, scene it was before, but now I have two cameras. I wish it would be slower. And down here, if you've ever used like Unity or anything like that, you can see that I can move around this uh, by dragging and dropping this in, in, in a three-dimensional view. So what does that actually look like? So let's actually go into our DOM here. And let's see, hey, Austin, you said we're not rendering any DOM. We've got some stuff on the screen. What does that, what's that actually going to look like? And so I'm going to go into my Spears component. And you can see our renderer. And so I'm going to pop open the render. You can see the render created a canvas object. So WebGL is ac accomplished by using a canvas object. Uh, we have our orbit controls. We have our VR controls. And then we have our scene. And notice now there's nothing under the scene. So we've purely rendered a WebGL, WebVR experience using Angular here and not actually added anything to the scene. Thanks. So let's take a look at our code real quick. So um, in our app component here, uh, we just have a fun button here at the top that allows us to toggle between. If you guys, uh, after the sh show, you can check out uh, the GitHub page. I've got the demo, the slides, and the notes, and you can view this in your cardboard, actually. And so I've got a couple different scenes that you can toggle between a video and stuff like that. Um, but down here we have our page navigation, and this is where our VR toggle button comes into play. And then we have our WebGL stuff, nicely named. And then inside our app Spears component here, again, I define my render. I have a input to my VR component, this, or my render that says, is this in VR mode? I have some controls. Orbit controls are your mouse and keyboard. VR controls are your head tracking, so they just toggle enabled. Uh, whenever one's in the other mode. Then we have our scene component. Under there we have a camera, lights, action. <laughs> and uh, then we have some spears. And just like before, we're using a loop, NG4 loop, adding some bindings here, and presto. Now, what we wanna look for is we want our objects uh, in our controls to actually be you know, true you know, components and not have any imp implementation detail. So we've created this really awesome uh, spear geometry here, and it adds a, uh, a spear to the screen for us, and that's really awesome, but that's not gonna do anything. It's just gonna add it to the screen. We actually need to provide some type of implementation detail. And one of my favorite things about Angular is these view children and content children. You'll see I use them everywhere. We can, what we can do is we can actually read out the spear components in our app component here, and then I, you know, I want to make my balls bounce. So what I do is I, in after view, view init here, I call this animate function. 
And it's really important, one thing to note here is we actually want to run the animate loops outside of Angular zone detection because we're not actually doing anything with Angular and we don't want to incur the change to detection penalty or anything like that. So we run these outside of our zones, request the animation frame, which moves the tick to the GPU, and now we're going to call this recursive function uh, called animate. And animate's going to get our spears, it's going to run some fancy math, and then it's going to update the position of those. So now I've got my bouncing implementation and my spears created. So if we jump back to what we were talking about here, what's next? Um, you know, what I showed here is a pretty basic implementation of how to do WebGL with Angular and how to do WebVR. The performance kind of starts to hit a bottleneck uh, because some of the concepts I demonstrated, you know, just simply blacklisting, we need to take it a step further. The demonstration I had was about 50 spears. Uh, at about 100, you start to see some performance degradation, and at about 300, it really starts to drop down. And so we're going to really have to, you know, focus with the team and try to create some better rendering. Um, running outside of zones, I think, is a good possibility that we can look at uh, to explore more. But native compilation um, is probably the bigger hit that we're going to have in order to truly accomplish these extremely rich environments. And with native compilation, we can use compilers, like in the previous, uh, previous talk, to actually take our Angular components and compile them down to be uh, native applications that we can deploy to our headsets or whatever that may be. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And if you don't, uh, Frosty mentioned this earlier, if you don't already know, you can actually go to our live stream today and view the, the f live feed in WebVR uh, using YouTube. So that's really awesome. Thanks, guys.